hey, I'm back to talk with you about research. It's a big topic, so I've broken it down into four sections. The questions you'll want to ask, where you can find some answers, more research tools, and opposition research. Here's what you'll learn. Why even do research? What questions to ask and where to find answers? A research ninja will share his tricks with you. Researching your opponents and stealth lobbying, otherwise known as AstroTurf, also called total BS campaigns. Now, some research in a campaign is scientific, but much of it's much closer to investigative journalism. No matter how you characterize it, it's hard to overemphasize the critical role that research plays in modern organizing and advocacy campaigns. Wanting to win your campaign is one thing, but being prepared to back up your case, influence persuadable decision makers, and refute your opponents is everything. All people take in information and form biases. As an organizer, you make decisions based on the information you take in that will cause your campaign to win or lose. As an activist, your biases are probably on an extreme end of the spectrum because you're motivated to spend time organizing rather than doing something more lucrative. Organizers will run into trouble if we make decisions based on our own assumptions, feelings, and biases rather than on facts. So we need to be aware of the relevant facts to help us understand what our opponents are doing so we can do something better. If you're like most of us, you probably spend most of your time with people who think like you do and agree with you. And you need to know what the rest of the world thinks and what really motivates constituents and your target decision makers. The bottom line is that only research will give you the information you need to improve the quality of your decisions. There's an endless number of questions you could ask about your target, and you could waste a lot of time gathering useless bits of information unless you plan and organize how you'll research. In this section, I'll present a series of questions and sources to find answers to them. But this information is intended to give you a sense for some of the information you should consider. Your specific campaign probably won't need to tap all these resources that you'll learn here, but at least you'll have a better sense of what the campaign research universe looks like. You need to be clear about the goal or purpose of your research, the data you'll need to achieve that goal, and the steps you'll take to gather that data. Ask yourself how accurate your information has to be. Can you rely on estimates and analyses, or do you need precise information? Is your research for internal purposes, or will it go into public statements, which need to be backed with well-documented facts that can stand up to challenges? Does your campaign require that you release facts from sustained research over a long period of time? Before you invest time and money in research, make it a point to see if the same research has already been done within your organization or by someone sympathetic outside of your organization. Keep good records of your own research, including the dead ends, so future researchers don't have to repeat your efforts and so that you'll have an accurate, credible answer if someone challenges your findings. Research must permeate your entire campaign strategy from beginning to end, building a clearer and clearer picture of what you need to do to win. Before your team comes together to hammer out or update a campaign plan, Invest in thorough research and preparation so your time together is more productive. Before you have a meeting, circulate instructions about what people need to do before your meeting and what information you expect them to have. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Say you're considering contacting a potential leader or important decision maker about your issue. What should you know about them going in to be truly effective? To begin with, why specifically should this person care or be moved by your issue? Like, I want to know, what makes Bill Clinton cry? What makes Margaret Thatcher cry? What makes President Obama cry? What makes George Bush cry? Both George Bushes. If this is an elected official, who are their constituents? What are the cultural and economic demographics of their district? Is your issue controversial in the district? Have these constituents ever been polled or focus grouped on your issue? What local or state laws in their district affect your issue? When is an office holder up for re-election? When were they appointed and for how long of a term? By what margin did they win their last election? Are they vying for a chairmanship or leadership position or running for a higher office? Which policymakers' leads are they most likely to follow on your issue? Whose political campaigns have they given money to and who has contributed to them? If they're in business, who are their major customers and vendors? 
What corporate and organizational boards do they sit on? What media outlets influence your target and how are those outlets disposed towards your issue? Where'd they grow up? Where were they educated? Do they have a spouse or children? What previous jobs have they had? Who are they related to and friends with? What's the best way to get an in-person meeting with them? Should you call them directly? Can you get a constituent or mutual acquaintance to make the meeting request instead? What causes do or have they supported? What criticism do they receive and from whom? What's on the top of their legislative agenda and how might that impact your issue? What congressional committees have they served on and why? What caucuses are they members of? And has your organization approached them for support before? How'd that go? Research is a big, important job for any campaign. So check out Charlie's research video because he is a research ninja. I know you'll get some good pointers from Charlie about tools you can use in your own research and when to deploy them. And when we come back, we'll discuss more places you can find answers to your questions. Experienced researchers know that the most valuable information isn't in the priciest databases, it's in the minds of individuals. Current and former policymakers, their staff, reporters, and industry insiders are an excellent source of both the most current information and your issue's history. Much of the information you want is probably not published anywhere public. Experts can give you the inside scoop and share opinions and perspectives you won't find anywhere else. If you don't know any experts and don't know anyone who can introduce you to some, pick up the phone and introduce yourself. Explain why you seek that information, listen carefully to their response, and thank them profusely. Assuming you trust the expert and you had a positive conversation, consider inviting them to future campaign planning meetings. Establishing a good relationship with an expert is invaluable and can be your ticket to the most up-to-date information about your issue. Of course, before going public with information that you get directly from people, you must check and document all facts and get the consent of your sources. Every research project can benefit from interviewing people. In conversations and interviews, researchers can discover and benefit from people's interests, information, and opinions. Here's a tip for you before you pick up the phone or reach out to an expert. Your call might be answered by a call router, you know, the computer voice that tells you to press 1 if you know your party's extension or 2 if you want to dial by last name. If you're like every other person in the modernized world, you've been stuck in one of these call routers and unable to talk to anyone, let alone the right person. You might not even know who the right person is to talk to yet. When you find yourself in that situation, just get anyone on the phone, it doesn't matter who, and tell them who you want to speak to. You could say, Hi, I'd like to talk to the person in charge of overseeing government contracts. The person on the other end of the line will probably say, Oh, that's not me. You need to talk to Jan Smith. Let me transfer you. Other good places to get information about your issue are industry events like trade shows, industry conferences, and investor meetings. Companies often assume that only insiders and friends show up. Many of these events are open to the public, where they often divulge information that isn't publicly disclosed anywhere else. Of course, one of your first stops in your research is going to be the internet. But to be most effective, you'll have to overcome the belief that a simple Google or Wikipedia search turns up everything you need to know. It doesn't. While Google searches over 8 billion pages of the visible web, much of which are broken links and garbage, it doesn't search the invisible web or deep web, which refers to the part of the web that's not indexed by search engines, and it's estimated to have over 500 times as much content than the searchable web. I've included a download here of some entry points to the deep web, but know that the list changes all the time, so you might have to do some poking around yourself. Another way to research policymakers is by reading political news every day. Stay current by reading Politico.com, Rollcall.com, the daily briefing of Congressional Quarterly, and the National Journal. You can subscribe to their news alerts and blogs to zoom in on different parts of government. For example, for a real inside baseball look at Congress, every move and the latest thinking of anyone, check out Politico's Huddle. Many of these news sources have apps for your smartphone, so you never have to miss a headline. Follow local and regional political reporters' stories, blogs, and tweets. Stateline.org is also an excellent news source for state politics, but you've got to pay for that. 
Subscribe to any relevant trade publications, nonprofit organizations, newsletters, blogs, and Twitter feeds so you'll get the latest substantive information on the topic you're working on. See if Bloomberg BNA, the National Journal's Congressional Daily, Energy and Environment Daily, or another such service covers your issue. And if they do, subscribe if you can. And, of course, another excellent way to gather information is through polling and focus groups. The purpose of a focus group is to listen. Focus groups are a form of qualitative research in which a group of people is asked about its perceptions, opinions, beliefs, and attitudes towards your campaign's messages and images. Questions are asked in an interactive group setting where participants are free to talk with other group members. Oftentimes, you'll be able to observe the discussion taking place unseen behind a two-way mirror. Polling and focus groups aren't cheap, but they're critical. It'll cost you more in the long run to not budget for it. They're far more reliable than your own self-perception and certainly less costly than losing your campaign. To reduce costs, find a polling firm that has the volume to do an omnibus survey where they'll ask a couple questions for you along with questions that they'll ask respondents during the same survey for other clients. If you don't do these things, what you know are basically your position and your opponent's position. Beyond that, what you think you know are probably really your biases. To move beyond your biases, you'll need to spend some money on research. $50,000 of paid advertising with an untested message is worth far less than $25,000 in paid advertising with a tested message. Another important part of research you must do before and during your campaign to know if your efforts are working is monitoring the output of the print, online, and broadcast media about your issue. It should be done by an unbiased media monitoring person or company. They will systematically record radio and television broadcasts, collect press clippings from print media, and gather data online. What they look for is media output that makes reference to your organization, campaign, or issue, and then they gauge the tone of the output, whether it's positive, negative, or neutral, and whether your campaign generated it or not. Media monitoring tells you not only if your efforts are paying off, but if a message in the media needs a response. Consider engaging a volunteer or intern to help you with your research, since finding the most accurate, relevant information is time-consuming. Since time is scarce, and you need to have accurate information almost instantly, it's worth training those on your team, yourself included, in how to do research. The Capital.net offers research training, and Good Jobs First offers a training on corporate research. Policymakers and their staff will rely on you for timely, accurate, unbiased, succinct information about your issue, so the info you provide must be bulletproof. If you misinform a policymaker, you need to go back to that person with a correction. Verify that the URLs and email addresses you're sharing with policymakers are current and correct. Confirm facts before you spread rumors. Don't make your allies look bad. Don't violate copyrights. And don't break embargoed information or confidentiality. In the digital age, sensitive information can be forwarded to opponents or the media with a single intentional or accidental keystroke. If the information you want to transmit to a policymaker or staff is even the least bit sensitive and you wouldn't want to read about it in the newspaper, pick up the phone and call the policymaker's office instead of sending an email. Really, resist your urge to write everything in emails. Sensitive topics should be discussed in person or over the phone. If you're ghostwriting a press release, dear colleague letter, memo, or any other document for a policymaker, or even penning an op-ed or letter to the editor for a volunteer, be sure to delete any personal information that could trace the document back to you, such as who created the document and when. In Microsoft programs, for example, when you save a document using Save As, under the Tools menu, you can select Security Options and remove personal information. You can also look under File, then Properties, and manually delete all personal information hidden in a document. Be sure there are no track changes that can be traced to your campaign. If you don't take these precautions, your documents will share your internal deliberations with your opponents. So this would be another good time to take a break, and when you get back, we'll get into opposition research. As recently as a few decades ago, you could win a campaign with a positive message and little else. These days, one of the first steps in a serious campaign 
is to begin opposition research, sometimes called oppo, the term used to describe efforts to acquire information about your opponent in order to find weaknesses, expose conflicts of interest, and point out contradictions. It not only helps you identify your opponent's weaknesses, it also helps you prepare for their next moves, telling you whom they're trying to reach and with what message. That information could be legal or criminal, biographical, medical, educational, financial, public or private, voting records, or prior media coverage. Opposition research is used not just to try to sink your opposition's campaign before it starts, but to develop messages you'll use internally with coalition partners and to help your target policymakers. Illegal or unethical means of gathering potentially damaging information on opposition includes accessing credit reports, wiretapping, theft of files, hacking computer files, and interviewing ex-spouses. While I advocate only legal, ethical opposition research, it's a good idea to assume your opposition has done research on you and your group, and their ethical standards may not be as high as yours. If you have questions about the legality of your methods, check with your boss or ask an attorney. Here are some of the things you can assume your opponents are probably doing. They're probably going over your website, campaign flyers, press releases, and even unpublicized information with a fine-toothed comb verifying the information you have there. They could be using Adobe Professional to save your web pages forever. They could be attending your events. Remember that not everyone who attends your events uses their real names. It's a good idea to assume that your opponents are at your events and signing up for your news alerts using different pseudonyms, mailing addresses, and emails so they can keep close track of who you're sharing your list and information with. Assume they're subscribed to your Facebook and Twitter feeds and have a presence in everything public that you do. They may be verifying your team's personal residences, where taxes are paid and tax bills are sent, home sale prices and past employers, because that information frequently exposes irregularities and malfeasance. If you have a post office box listed, it may be perceived as a lack of funding, support, or organization. They may be researching who provides services to your organization, searching for conflicts of interest. They could be looking at voting records and your history of lawsuits. While no one tidbit they dig up on you is likely to knock you out of the running, it will add to the cumulative work that can chip away at your credibility, shape their campaign message, and give them and the media tough questions to ask you. That's what opposition research is all about. Opposition research can happen online through the invisible or deep web, and it could even happen through private investigators or professional opposition researchers. There's a whole industry of people who dig up this kind of information. The Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, is a law that allows for the full or partial disclosure of previously unreleased information and documents controlled by the United States government. FOIA presumes that the government will disclose information. The government must substantiate why information would not be released. Upon written request, agencies of the U.S. government are required to disclose records unless they can be lawfully withheld from disclosure under one of nine specific exemptions in FOIA. The American Civil Liberties Union offers good guidance on how to get information through FOIA. And many states have similar open records request acts. The Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press maintains information about every state's open records and open meetings laws, as well as a federal open government guide. Some government agencies are still reluctant to share data, despite the law. Pursuing the matter in court may help, but deciding whether or not to go that route depends on what it's worth to you. First, see if you can get the information you need over the phone or electronically. If you have to do it by mail, expect there to be a fee. If you have to send a written request, send the request by overnight mail and include an overnight mail return shipping label, which will sometimes motivate document clerks to expedite your request. Being able to show that your opponent's ideas are not original could also be a boon to your campaign. There are many free websites that help you determine who your opposition and policymakers are quoting. Some examples include Plagium, Duplichecker, and Plagiarisma. You'll need to store all your research results. Evernote is a free note-taking and archiving service that lets you store text, web pages, photos, voice memos, and more. You can also use a free cloud storage service like Dropbox or Google Drive to store and share your work. Before you choose a cloud storage service like these, be sure to explore their latest security features. 
Opposition research involves getting a full picture of a policymaker or opponent by making a timeline of his or her life, including important personal events, employment, votes cast, votes missed, who contributed to their campaigns and when, travel, life events, and what organization or associations a policymaker belonged to and when, so the researcher knows if a policymaker was part of that organization when it made key decisions. Once the researcher has filled in the timeline, she steps back and looks at the story it tells. She asks, what kind of person is my opponent? Is that person untrustworthy, out of touch with average people, clearly profit-driven, an egomaniac, reckless, or inconsistent? If she has the resources, an opposition researcher tests the message she develops about her opponent in an opinion poll. When she hits on a story about her opponent that moves the numbers, she disseminates it through her communications channels. An opposition researcher isn't only telling a story about an opponent, she's also digging the dirt opponents find about her so she knows where she's vulnerable and can prepare her defense. So that's a ton of information and a lot of work. Your campaign research has to answer the most useful questions about your targets and opponents in a way that works with your budget. You don't have to do all of this, but if your campaign's foundation isn't solid research, it's probably your biases, and you're far less likely to win. I promise you it's worth the effort. Okay, let's stop here and do an exercise that will bring you another step closer to finishing a campaign plan. There's a kind of lobbying or campaigning your well-funded opponents might engage in that you should keep an eye out for. It's often referred to as stealth lobbying or astroturf as in the fake grass used in baseball stadiums that has no roots. Stealth lobbying is designed to have the appearance of concerned citizens persuading policymakers about an issue, but it really involves wealthy corporate interests paying people to make phone calls, attend events, and write letters to create the appearance of a movement. While most advocates will only present their side of an issue, stealth lobbyists deliberately hide or misrepresent their own identity and motives. It enables those who lack factual, moral, or scientific legitimacy, but have plenty of money, to buy what looks like science, authority, and legitimacy. The goal of stealth lobbying is to distort the breadth and depth of support or opposition for an issue. These approaches are used to seek out isolated, uninformed, or weakly held public attitudes and turn them into the illusion of a broad-based, deeply rooted citizen movement. Well-funded corporate interests buy citizens' voices and buy off community leaders. They pay for wholesome-sounding front groups like the group Energy Citizens that held rallies around the country opposing U.S. clean energy and climate legislation. That group's funded by the American Petroleum Institute. They pay potential critics to be silent through philanthropy, and they pay scientists, think tanks, and academics to release biased findings and reports intended to cast doubt on independent science. For example, scientists and economists were offered $10,000 by an ExxonMobil-funded organization to dispute a report from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And they pay for millions of dollars in paid advertising and propaganda. Stealth lobbying can also involve corporations forcing their employees to take an action or face losing their jobs. Both policymakers and reporters who cover your issue should be made aware of the stealth lobbying efforts of your opposition. You need to help policymakers separate deeply held public attitudes from the shallow opinions generated by stealth lobbyists. You need to help journalists understand the difference between the two before the damage is done to the media environment that shapes public policy. Fortunately, there's an antidote to stealth lobbying. By exposing it, you can draw public and policymaker attention to it. You can add deception to the list of grievances you have against your opponent and discredit them. You can then frame the conflicting interests as big money versus the little guy. How do you expose stealth lobbying? Either you have to do the research or you have to interest an investigative reporter in doing it for you. Chances are you'll have to do a combination of both. Do your own research and share your findings with a reporter. Make it as easy as possible for a busy reporter to help you by doing as much of his or her work as you can. It will be easiest to get a reporter's attention if you've already built a relationship with that reporter over time. 
Preferably, a reporter will use the information you give to write his or her own story, which will be more credible than if you were to simply accuse your opponents of stealth lobbying through a press release or press conference. Begin your research by reading news coverage of your issue in the trade publications that cover the industries involved. If a policymaker who's friendly to your issue tells you she's getting calls and letters from constituents opposing your position, ask the policymaker to inquire with those constituents about where they got their information and what motivated them to contact that office. You may learn that stealth lobbying was behind those calls and letters, which would be a good basis for a news story. Ask among your networks and ask those you know to ask people they know about any possible stealth tactics. Check out organizations that keep track of what corporations spend on lobbying and donations made to political campaigns. Some examples are the Center for Media and Democracy, the Federal Election Commission, Common Cause, Center for Public Integrity, Center for Responsive Politics, and Public Citizen. Let's say there's an academic who speaks out against your issue. Examine where she works, what organizations she's part of, and how corporate money could flow to her. Who funds her work? What articles has she published and where? If she works at a university, you should be able to find information about her salary. A reference librarian at the university should be able to help you. Find out the university's policy on disclosing honoraria and outside income for consulting. Can you access the IRS 990 forms that would list grants, donations, and honoraria made to the academic? If a public university resists getting you that information, you can ask the state secretary of education for help. If it's a private university and you're ready for the world to know about your sleuthing, you can ask a reporter to press the issue with the school. Get a hold of any public testimony the academic has given to any governing body. Are any of their close associates industry lobbyists? Looking at it from the other end, contact a foundation center library and check out the Chronicle of Philanthropy to find out which corporations and foundations are funding academic work on your issue. Increasingly, in some public health fields, stealth lobbying and related industry strategies to frustrate and block public health initiatives are becoming legitimate subjects of public health research. In the tobacco field, Court cases and legal settlements in the 1990s made large troves of internal tobacco industry documents available to the public, including researchers. Study of those documents has led to significant academic publication as well as media revelations about the tactics pursued by tobacco companies. For example, tobacco company Philip Morris also owned and controlled Miller Brewing in the 1990s, at the same time that the world's biggest alcohol companies formed a stealth lobbying organization called the International Center for Alcohol Policies, or ICAP. Based in Washington, D.C., ICAP is primarily active in less resourced countries. Norwegian researchers found that ICAP was writing and submitting draft national alcohol policies in several sub-Saharan African countries. Exposed in the academic journal Addiction, These policies bore the word processing signatures of an ICAP employee and conspicuously left out the most effective public health strategies for reducing alcohol problems. Besides, or in addition to, publishing exposés in academic journals, it's often useful to take your findings to a broader audience, and the news media can help you do that. If you're having trouble getting media attention for your story, consider some ways to make your story more enticing. Can you find people who were asked to take part in the stealth lobbying but refused? Can you find anyone who says they never authorized the use of their name or that they would never have signed the industry back petition had they known who was behind it or would have taken the opposite position if they had been given the whole story? Your media outreach can also include victims of the industry whose lives are affected by the corporate cash that funds the stealth lobby. If the stealth lobby is holding an event like an awards ceremony, press conference, shareholders meeting, or public forum, be sure to be there to observe their approach. You can get friendly policymakers and other allies to attend and ask revealing questions. You can offer a counter media event so your campaign can tell the whole story. You can disrupt their event with your message vocally or on signs, banners, and t-shirts. You can suggest questions reporters in attendance should ask the industry. Remember, you want to expose crooked tactics, not just yell louder than your opponents. There was a campaign in Texas, where I'm from, against dumping nuclear waste in the remote Chihuahuan Desert in the far western part of the state. 
The nuclear industry built a playground and gave the community a few things to buy their favor for their project. The National Low-Level Waste Management Program hosted a glittering media conference at an Austin hotel to promote the dump, entitled, Radiation, the Public Depends on You. The anti-nuke dump activist quietly reserved a meeting room across the hall where it held its own counter-conference, featuring leaders from the environmental justice movement and oncologists and other educators in a session called, The Banquet of the Rich Nuclear Industry. Activists sat at a table drinking what looked like blood and nuclear waste, and then they served bologna on silver platters. The next day, the counter-conference was news and papers across the state. Austin's newspaper editorialized against the dump for the first time, and state officials were calling the industry's conference a disaster, and the campaign had a ton of fun messing up their conference. Resist the temptation to run to the media with your discovery of stealth lobbying. Instead, ask yourself what would be accomplished if the story ran tomorrow or next week or next month or in six months. When will policymakers be making a key decision on your issue? Would your issue fit in well with the current media environment that's already reporting on your issue with some frequency? Or would your story come from out of nowhere and then lose its significance? Will your story be drowned out by media coverage of another event? Exposing stealth lobbying is only useful if it's part of a well-organized, multi-layer campaign that's trying to advance a policy goal. The purpose of revealing your opponent's untrustworthy behavior is to cast doubt on their claims that they have a better policy alternative than you do. It makes your job easier by giving your allies more to work with and opposing policymakers a reason to yield to you. If you're not constantly out in the community spreading your message, rest assured that the stealth lobby is, and it's their message that will flourish instead of yours. If you catch wind of your opponent's stealth or overt lobbying efforts in the communities whose support you need, consider it an emergency and inoculate there. Inoculation theory says that to prevent persuasion to your opponent's view, you've got to strengthen pre-existing attitudes, beliefs, or opinions in your favor and preempt your opponents. The communities in which you're active need to be warned about your opponent's efforts. Like an inoculation in the body, that threat initiates defenses for future attacks, and the pre-existing positive associations the community has about your issue are reinforced. When it comes time to talk to reporters about the stealth lobbying you've uncovered, the right spokesperson may not be you. Instead, it could be a former ally of the stealth lobby who finds their tactics appalling, community leaders who feel deceived by the stealth lobby, policymakers who take an unexpected position against the stealth lobby, or unbiased, respected political observers who can comment about how the tricks of the stealth lobby are undermining democracy. But sometimes the situation will call for you to be the spokesperson, so have your two-sentence soundbite prepared for the questions you anticipate hearing. Try to get more than one day's worth of media coverage for the stealth lobbying you've uncovered to keep the heat on policymakers and discredit the stealth lobby for as long as possible. Feed reporters evidence and revelations over time so you don't overwhelm them with data. Be sure to circulate the media coverage you get among policymakers and reporters, attaching a note saying, Hey, I want to be sure you saw today's story in the whatever media outlet. Release your story before congressional hearing, vote, or court decision on the issue when the media's interest is high. So exposing stealth lobbying will require using the research skills we've already covered to dig up the dirt on fake activists and movements and releasing your findings in the way that benefits your campaign. How you release the findings, how to extend the coverage, who your spokesperson is, and what media bites you might use are all things you'll need to think about. And now we're done with research. Whew, that was a lot! Again, you won't be using all this all the same time, but I want you to know what the range of possibilities is so you can be prepared. Now that you're wrapping up Module 4, you're better prepared to avoid rookie mistake number 4, which is getting blindsided because you research too little or not at all about your issue, opponent, or yourself. Yeah, that's a big no-no. And I'll see you in Module 5.